welcome to How I Made It in 3DS Max. Hi, my name is Paul Neal. I've been in the animation industry for some 30 years, working on feature films, broadcast television, AAA game titles, mobile games, medical, and even aerospace. I'm generally known as a technical artist, where I develop tools and workflows for companies to be able to work smarter and faster and save them money and time. I use those same skills in modeling, texturing, lighting, rendering, animation, and even VFX can save an enormous amount of time in production. Anytime models can be created procedurally as well as textures, it can save enormous amount of time because changes can be made very quickly and dynamically in real time. In the real time environment I'll be discussing in this series, we have an interaction between those kinds of objects where when one is updated, others will update automatically for the changes that have been created. You're going to see that we're utilizing OSL to be able to create dynamic shaders so that even when geometry updates, textures will automatically update with them. You can visit me at polneal.com as well as on my YouTube channel where I have hundreds of videos that can help you understand workflows that can save you time. Let's get started with the series and find new and exciting ways to create procedurally generated environments that'll save you time. In this series, we're going to be exploring many ways of creating procedural models. They'll speed up your workflows, make it easier for you to be able to make changes and updates to your sets. We'll take a look at dynamic shader tech using OSL to be able to drive textures that can update with changes in geometry utilizing the data channel modifier as well as other techniques that allow your shaders to be taken to the next level. We'll also look at optimization methods for your game models to ensure that they can run in real time once they're in a game engine. We'll also be covering a lot of tips and tricks along the way that will allow us to be able to use procedural modifiers and geometry so that we can create stunning visuals and sets that are able to be used in real time environments. As an overview, let's take a quick look at the set that I've created and see some of the things that I've done that are going to allow us to be able to create those dynamic and you know quickly created assets. Most of the geometry in this level has already been optimized and is being optimized on the fly as changes are being made. If we take a look at the poly counts, you can see they're pretty reasonable for the most part. Still have some areas that really should be updated or, you know, really optimized geometry created. But things like the ground, you can see, it's already been optimized and it's actually optimizing on the fly as changes are made to it and as other objects update dynamically. Even some of the foliage, the rocks, things like the outhouse and the silo are all updating as the ground changes as well. And when changes are made to items like the silo and the outhouse, it updates the ground and updates other objects around it. Let's take a look at how this has been done, how I've generated this uh, model, and how most of this, probably about 95% of it at least, has required zero poly modeling. In fact, the only objects I think that have been poly modeled to my uh, knowledge at this point has been the two pieces of wood and a couple little brackets that I created, but were very, very simply created using you know simple starting points with boxes and planes. The textures are also dynamic, and you're gonna see that they update automatically as changes are made. Even objects like the Anukshuk have moss on their top, and if the Anukshuk is laid over on its back, the moss remains on top, pointing up in world space. So let's you know dive in and have a look at how this has been created. We'll get started by having a look at how I did the ground object here. You'll notice it's this nice circular platform. It has different heights. And you know we've seen that when I move things around, it's going to automatically update. Well, it all started off with a circle. And that's the circle that's creating all of this ground at this point. 
So if we look at the circle, we'll notice that it is in bold lettering. And that bold lettering refers to the fact that it's a reference, not an instance, a reference. There's a difference. And as, if I just go Control V, um, you'll notice we have copies. So if we copied a sphere, for instance, they would be two separate spheres. Change the radius on one, it wouldn't change the radius on the other. Instance, they are both identical. I change the radius or any property on one, it changes and updates the other. A reference allows me to be able to make a reference copy of it, which means that the two spheres would be identical. But if I placed modifiers on the reference object, I'd be able to have a different modifier stack. And if I placed modifiers on the original, it would grow on both of them. OK, so this circle has been referenced and you'll notice that if I increase the size of it, it increases the size of the ground plane. It all auto updates. The river uh, gets clipped off correctly to the right size and, you know, the ground can grow in and out. So what's happening there is we have references. If we start with the simplest, uh, which is just this outer piece, this outer piece is the circle and there's the reference. Everything above that line will be unique to this reference object. I have a normalized spline on there and that normalized spline is just so that it can give it more um, you know, vertices around it. I then have a sweep modifier sweeping, you know, the bar section around and I've given it a chamfer. You could have also done that in the sweep modifier. So to, uh, to set that up. So if I change the radius of the original circle, it's changing the radius for this outer piece. Same thing is happening for the ground. The ground starts as the circle and everything again above this line is then referenced, you know, and is unique to this reference object. So what I start with is a subdivide. Now I've turned off show end result. You can toggle that with alt tilt. And I'm using an adaptive subdivision method because I find it's nice and clean. If you look at this, the uh, subdivide, it gets these lines in it, whatnot, whereas adaptive tends to give you this really nice, clean, you know, amount of triangles evenly distributed. You can change the edge length to change up how many segments are going to be created in the original. And then use a volume select. And that volume select in this case is choosing this object that you see in the middle of the screen as the selection method. So it's using it creating vertex selections with a mess object with this cylinder here. And if we you know, select the cylinder and move it around, you'll notice that it updates all of the ground in real time. Not only is it updating the ground, it's updating the textures, and it's also optimizing the ground as it goes and it's doing it seamlessly. Now this object here is just a cylinder and you can see it just comes up as a cylinder and I put a noise on it so we can get some nice sort of jaggy edges, you know, um, that are uh, sticking out everywhere. So that's the uh, volume select. To get the ground to go up, I just put a push on it and pushed it up and a little bit of a relax, not much, but I put a bit of relax, not really necessary or important in this case, but I felt that you know I needed to soften the edges of the selection a little bit. The volume select has the soft selection turned on, by the way. The next thing we have is the data channel modifier. Now I'm gonna come back to this because this is needed for the materials. So we'll discuss the materials second. Then I go on to another volume select. And this volume select again is doing exactly the same thing. It's creating vertex selection. It's based on a, another mesh object and it has a soft selection on it. And that mesh object is this one here, okay? And I'm currently showing that as a box, just right click object properties, display as box off. And you can see all of this then is, is a cylinder with a taper, a noise, and a path to form, and it's path to formed along a spline. It has auto stretch turned on, so it's automatically the full length of the spline. I don't have to worry about how you know, long it is. I pull that spline longer, it'll uh, you know, become longer itself. With that back displayed as box, it's selecting the um, ground here, and it's pushing it down. So the volume select here is selecting the ground and this time I have a push and it's pushing it down into the ground and another data channel modifier. Again, we'll come back to that so that we can see how those work individually. Another volume select 
And you'll notice this volume select is actually the base of the silo in this case. So it is being, uh, you know, there's a selection object here, which is this one. And that object is a tube. So again, it's been set to display as box just so that, you know, we're not seeing it. And you can see that's just a, you know, going to be able to select that area around the ground. Now, one of the things I also do with these objects that are all helper objects is I turn off renderable. That way I can filter them very quickly in the viewport just by turning on the viewport filter. And of course, if I happen to forget and leave them visible when I'm doing a render, they don't render. And so I don't need to worry about those. So now what's going to happen is, is that, you know, everything is updating. The ground is getting pushed up here. You know, it's getting pushed up. A little bit of noise is being uh, added to it. Another data channel modifier. I put a mesh select to kill the selection, basically turn off the selection by not having any of the sub objects on. And then the optimize at the top of the stack. So it's optimizing everything, you know, down. And that optimize is set with a, you know, given face threshold. The bias, you want to play with that right now. I've got it at 0.5, but you'll notice what happens when you uh, play with your bias up and down. Found 0.5 was getting me the curves nicely, but in the bigger flat areas, it was reducing the poly count quite significantly. And that's what I was looking for. So that's essentially the ground um, as it is at this point. Now, with as things update, for instance, as we update the uh, and move the silo around, you can see it's updating everything. It's got rocks that are being projected down to the ground. It even has grasses that don't look like they're in the correct folder, uh, correct layer, but uh, grasses that grow around the bottom and move with it as well. So the river itself is also has references going on. There's a spline that's determining where this cylinder is being stretched. So the path to form is going along this top spline here. Now I wanted to be able to have the river down below and have it on, uh, you know, one uh, below it. And so I decided to make a reference of that. Probably could have done it other ways, but you know, it could have offset the path to form is another way, but this works perfectly well. This is a reference of that line. So any changes to this line affect this line. And on this one, we have simply a plane, a plane, a wave, a taper, path to form again, and a Boolean object to clip off the edges. And this is again, a neat way to work here. Because we're using references of this original circle, if we go back to the Boolean and we take a look at the Boolean, you'll notice that it has a Boolean object and it has been set to intersect. And if we take a look at what that Boolean object is, it looks like it's a cylinder. It could have been actually with some wiring and whatnot, we could have connected it back, but it's actually a reference again of that original circle with an extrude on it to extrude it up so that when it gets extruded up, we can use it to clip off the edges of the water. That's why it's getting a little bit slow when we're um, you know, moving this around with the Boolean turned on. You'll notice that the water, as we change it, it's, it's a little bit crunchy because it's actually automatically clipping off the ends as we go. And that takes a little bit more processing power. If we went and turned off the Boolean and did that and made those changes, you'll now notice that those changes are happening, you know, absolutely in real time with, uh, you know, virtually no lag whatsoever. Next, we'll take a look at the materials and how they're being driven by data channel.